Hey everybody, it's Bust with Battles with Bust number 299. Almost got ourselves up to 300, and today we'll be doing battle with Fiora Shivana. And so, uh, this is an interesting deck. This brings forth a lot of topics uh, that I like to talk about that you may or may not have considered or heard of. And it's not necessarily just about the deck list itself, but uh, the competitive gaming in general. And so, uh, Fiora Shivana, this is kind of interesting to me. Uh, shortly after the release of the 4 1 patch, uh, we were looking to. Uh, take usage of Shivana. Uh, she was recently updated to where she now needs 16 damage to flip, but she doesn't have to actually see the damage. And so at the end of the day, uh, this makes it much easier uh, for Shivana to flip, uh, allows her to be much stronger in combat, and then she generates the uh, the dragon single combat, which her specific copies only cost two mana instead of three. And so a uh, very powerful set of Shivana. We were pairing her off with Pantheon, and we were using this kind of idea that uh, the things that like to be targeted are the faded units. It turns out that the Wounded White Flame is a faded unit and also a dragon, and so the Wounded White Flame had a, a nice bit of tie-in uh, to what was happening with Pantheon, what was happening with Shivana, and it turned out to be a, you know, reasonably strong deck. But uh, I wasn't happy with the space that the, uh, the the kind of bruisery decks were going into uh, the Runeterra Open, and so I put it on the shelf and went and looked towards some other things. But uh, as I was, you know, scrolling through the Twitter in the previous day or so, uh, I was uh, impressed to see a tweet come up by old Ruben Zhu. And so uh, Ruben Zhu, Steve Ruben, he's the uh, the competitive lead over at uh, Riot. If you ever see uh, those competitive articles go up on Playroom Terra, there's a pretty good chance that he is... Uh, credited down at the bottom. An absolutely uh, fantastic player, arguably one of the best in the world. He's held uh, the number one on the ladder uh, multiple times, and you can see in his little byline here, he's won a Magic Pro Tour, uh, 14 Grand Prix top eights, two Star City Games wins. Not a bad resume, slightly better than mine, right? <laughs> but uh, most certainly a, a well-established magician, and now uh, Rune Terran. But uh, to kind of step away from that, the, the first thing I wanted to talk about here is his top tweet. We did the thing again, went for something actually fair once and had a grand old time. He's got 50 matches under his belt with Fiora Shivana uh, carrying that at an 84% win rate. And so I was interested. I was curious. I said, what does he do uh, with the Fiora Shivana? How did he uh, go about this archetype? And this is kind of the next interesting thing. Uh, that you're able to pull up is if you head over to uh, your favorite deck tracking site, we are just on uh, the LOR Master site, you're able to just go and search him up. And so on LOR Master, if you're over on the left, you hit the little magnifying glass, then up here uh, in the top center, there's the search bar, uh, you just start typing in Riot, and uh, it'll eventually pop up. And so uh, where that gets us is you're able to see that he's played this grand amount of Fiora Shivana. Looks like he's up to 74 games, so he's been grinding it kind of hard, currently sitting at rank 30 on the ladder. Not a bad day. But if you're over here on the archetypes list on the left, you are able to uh, pull up the deck list that he's been playing with. And as we take a peek at the Fiora Shivana, uh, it was extremely similar uh, to what we were looking to do with the dragons. It's got the uh, additional equipments coming out of the Dark and Aegeus, but we were uh, looking to use the Lodestone. Uh, in terms of early game, we were more heavily centered on the gym uh, makers, since we're playing with Pantheon and we need to get him to flip, the gems are the easy way to get those targets over and over again. Uh, this has a bit more uh, interactive style package with the Steadfast Elkins, the Broadwings, and the Dragon Chows. Uh, but outside of that, a lot of the same ideas and themes are running around. It's got Wounded White Flames along with the Wandering Shepherd. It's got the Darken Equipment. Uh, single Combats and Concerted Strikes are here. Guiding Touches and Pale Cascades. That's all pretty similar. The, the big uh, advances that he has is, of course, playing with Shivana. That's a pretty big, uh, different directional step from playing Pantheon. Uh, and then the additional strikes coming from the fish fights. And so uh, I thought this was pretty interesting. It made me want to kind of circle back to it, uh, not necessarily play the list 
list that he was looking to play, uh, but kind of tie it in with uh, what we're going to go with here today. And that did bring me to the kind of next topic I wanted to talk about before uh, you get back into the, the deck list itself here. Uh, and that is just kind of an evaluation uh, of the text that you're reading, right? You're not just going to see that Ruben Zoo immediately jump to the top of the ladder playing a deck, assume it's the best deck in the world, and immediately jump in with it. You should certainly uh, go out and give it a try. But uh, the, the thing that you have to kind of think about when you see people like Ruben Zhu post deck lists or Majin Bay post deck lists or Drissoff post deck lists are those people are exceptionally better at the game than you. And maybe there's one or two listeners out there that this doesn't apply to, but no disrespect to the le- the rest of us. These people are just exceptionally strong, exceptionally good at the game, and they're going to be able to carry high win rates with bad decks. And I, I learned this earlier on in my Magic career. There was a couple of people in my play circle that were at that next level level they were at that uh, deep run at the pro tour uh, level of skill and they were able to just play some really really garbagey decks uh, to, to great success because they were typically picking on players that uh, were weaker than them and so that's a, another kind of thing to kind of keep in the back of your head when you see Majin Bay playing Rise or you see Dressoff playing Lord Broadmains uh, or now whatever Ruben Zhu is bringing to the party uh, these people are better than you at the game and they're going to be able to command a higher win rate but That's not to say that these people haven't developed something exceptional. That's something that you're going to have to kind of come out and find on your own. If you want the uh, the most direct example of that, we can look at Ruben Zhu. He was the one that uh, really put forth the Aphelios Fizz deck that was extremely dominant uh, right before it. It hit a weird spot to where it was extremely strong right for a seasonals. It was the best deck at seasonals, but only like 10% of the people played it. And then they immediately nerfed it into oblivion. But <laughs> he was the... He was the person that really uh, brought that deck to the forefront. He hit rank one on the ladder with it. Uh, And so it's not to say that the things they've put forth aren't particularly good. You just have to kind of keep that idea in your mind with a little grain of salt. Uh, There's a much, much greater chance that me and you are on uh, the, the the same competitive landscape as opposed to you. And the likes of Ruben Zug. And no disrespect, it's just uh, the way the world goes sometimes, you know. (laughs) But uh, as we cycle back to the deck, there's a a few things I didn't like about what he was doing. Number one, I don't want to play that 0-3 dragon thing that draws a card when it gets struck. I think it's garbage. Uh, I have no uh, interest or desire in playing it. So it's been uh, removed from the table. Kind of in its place, we are going to be running the Divine Clerk. Uh, I just like the little bit of extra... Uh, lifesteal advantage that you get from the clerk. It helps carry through some of these harder matches in the space of aggro. Uh, and then uh, I, I like I don't like having these games to where we roll into turn three with nothing to do. And if we do have those games, uh, the Divine Clerk helps uh, dig us back out of them a little bit. And so I'm reasonably happy with it. Uh, and then the next thing that I have to say is I, I think this deck kind of runs into the problem of where you need to uh, elusive, overwhelm, or rally. The, the, the reason, one of the reasons this was exceptionally uh, exciting to me to see come around is I've been contemplating uh, what is our best way to attack Nora. I feel like Nora is really, really uh, spreading throughout the meta, and to kind of a lesser extension, the, the Tristana decks play very similarly, uh, as to where they have a bunch of portals or a bunch of fairies to flood the board with. The traditional way to attack this is just overwhelms, but you kind of want your overwhelms to be on the smaller end of the spectrum, like kind of spread out, or you need to be able to protect them from removal spells. And so uh, to that end, like I don't really want to be playing this deck in the sense that uh, if Fiora fails, if the Fiora plan doesn't work, uh, then the deck isn't able to close out those games. And so uh, to, to kind of tear off with that conversation. I think Fiora is a fantastic answer to all the Nora. Uh, I I didn't think of it. No, Fiora typically isn't on my radar because it's not the style of deck that I typically play, uh, but this is a, a fantastic innovation uh, into the lands of Nora here. But last but not least, we're playing the single copy of Dragon's Clutch. Uh, I like having the access to uh, giving all of our dragons overwhelm. It's not that rare. To where you'll have like a eight attack and a seven attack um, 
what do you call it, wounded white flame just running down the board, but they can't actually deal any damage. Uh, it's just quite nice having access to the uh, overwhelm you get from the clutch or the two dragon draw in a pinch if you need some of that really late game card advantage. And so I'm excited to jump in. I hope you are too. Let's go ahead and head on into battle. So where are we at almost, Ruben? Here you are. Hit up that ranked queue. I don't think we'll be hitting masters on this account today, but maybe we can get close, you know? The other one's, the other one's hanging up there and doing just fine. That's a <laughs> Good stuff. All right, the first battle is here. What do we see? Darius LeBlanc in the Frey Lord. I thought this was immediately just going to be the Bone Club deck, but then seeing uh, Darius turn up, or I'm sorry, seeing LeBlanc turn up has me a little skeptical uh, on what we're about to encounter. And so I'm a little scared. I, I like having the Broadwing as we're coming out against Freylord decks. Their defensive measures tend to be things like um, uh, like the, the Frostbites or Troll Chants or whatever, and it doesn't really interact with the Broadwings well. So I think it's a, a reasonable hang on to here in the early game. Still curious what we're going to be up against. There's some argument to just not play the Elkin early uh, as we roll into this next turn, and we want the potential to put a uh, Challenger onto the Broadwing, but we'll see how things roll out. He's still a, a fairly formidable bro, <laughs> even without the assistance of uh, another unit. All right, dude's got a trapper, but I got tough. Let's send it in. Oh, he blocks. He takes it back. <laughs> he says, no thank you, friend. No thank you. You are indeed too tough for me to handle. What do we got here? I was curious to see how this goes. I don't think we have to worry about LeBlanc too much. The The question here is going to be, do we want to come after her with Fiora? Uh, and if we do go after her with Fiora, do we want to uh, try and have the Fiora survive? I think it's going to be okay. Like We're going to take the damage here 100% of the time, but I think adding Fiora to the board keeps him from attacking with this Trapper, even if he has uh, a combat trick. Let's see how it goes. I was I was just going to put the Darkened Lodestone onto her, but if we pick up Quick Attack, that's pretty enticing. Uh, and then even if we don't, the remainder of the equipment are pretty similar. But let's see what turns up. Ooh, Quick Attack. Not bad, not bad. Now... Do we want to just kind of go super all in here? I think we do. His board sucks a lot, right? <laughs> and so we like you have to think about what is this deck going to be able to present at us? And I mean, if he has like a Whirling Death or a Strike card, I, I think we still want to be growing the Shepherd and, and keeping these strong attacks coming in. We don't have a great way to stop this Glory Seeker into Fiora, but I think it's fine to give up on her, right? We don't have one of these hands that's uh, really capable of presenting a Fiora OTK. Opponent doesn't know that, but we know that. And so uh, I think it's okay to just like send her into, um, send her into LeBlanc, assume that you're going to win, and then have her die on the following combat. Yeah, this is interesting. I, I am admittedly not a, a particularly strong Fiora player. I really just need to put in the time. Uh, this is one of these spaces to where... Um, let's go ahead and... Sh well, she's probably reasonable against Kindred Nasus. It's like, I don't really want to be going tall with Fiora, but they tend to have a lot of sacrificable units that are really strong targets. But no, as like... Uh, I went through the kind of like bruiser week after the release of the 4-1 patch. I, I feel uh, much more confident playing champions like... Uh, Pantheon and playing champions like Varus, uh, and I don't know, I've probably just got like 100, uh, 100 150 games in with them. Uh, but it's uh, just something that where Fiora is a lot different, and I've never just sat around and played a ton of Fiora. It's something that I probably should include into the old uh, into the old tool bag, but haven't done it yet. 
All right, we'll add in the Broadwing now. I open attack because our our turn gets kind of shut down if he has uh, a ruined uh, prey maker. <laughs> the the three one that generates a prey. It's not going to be a particularly strong round for us if uh, if that's what comes on the board. And so I was okay to give up on it. Now here we can build into this Fiora if she just gets smoked by a Vengeance right away. That's not so bad, but he's devoted units to the board like Minion, and so we should be able to uh, attack him you know, fairly repeatedly here. We have a bit of heal with the Guiding Touch, Pale Cascade to protect her a little bit more than a single combat for an additional strike. So we have a, a pretty strong Fiora uh, base. Seems a little bit better to just drop her as opposed to bringing in the Wandering Shepherd, and so we can recover her if necessary. All right, let's bring it in. Sure. Not a bad spot to be in. Getting a nice little board built up here. Uh, I, I continually... Oh, he just... He overdrew his NASA, so LOL. Uh, but I... Uh, I continually start to worry if these decks are going to be playing uh, the the likes of uh, Ruination. Well, let's see. We're we're grooving. We're we're pounding in here. I I kind of suspected that there was going to be a um, that there was going to be a. Uh, vengeance coming in at Fiora, but not quite the case. That seems like a pretty safe round, right? He's only got two mana back. So we can we can drop the single combat, try and take down the Kindred. If he's got a Vile Feast, we have protection in the Pale Cascade. Sure. Now, I'm curious if we if we just start to pivot, right? Like, are we really going to be getting uh, a Fiora OTK this round? Or should we just switch to damage mode, right? We can we can blast in for eight. Because I, I don't feel like she's going to be... Uh, I don't feel like she's going to be generating OTKs. So we're just going to pull in one of these. Take a little bit of width instead of trying to boost the Fiora. But I definitely wanted to just attack here. Well, <sighs> I don't know how big his Nasus is. That was my worry with this turn, right? Is it's like, okay, well, we play the Screeching Dragon and then he plays Nasus, but his Nasus should just be like a 4 4, right? He's only done two slays. So maybe that was a little sloppy. We could have gotten the Screeching Dragon onto board this turn. Uh, brought a little bit more thunder in. And then if he plays Nasus, we probably just outright win the game, right? What do we got? Concerted Strike. We'll go for the Pale Cascade just to continue to punch this damage in. Right, it's going to weaken the, the Shepherd down to one health so it doesn't die to the Hate Spike. Not a bad combat. Alright, but definitely feel much safer. Those were some pretty good draws that we just spiked between uh, the Concerted Strike and the Repost. We should be pretty well protected in this upcoming turn. Don't really care about Kindred. Ooh, and the Expanse's Protection. Just get it all <laughs> and say please and thank you. Hang on, let's let's strike with the the Elkin first. I don't suspect there's gonna be a barrier coming out, right? There's no card that can really produce that, but might as well be minimally safe here. 
All right, he's out of mana, so we can be out of mana. Should be in a pretty good spot to end this next round. Not going to hook anything with Fiora again. We're, we're just going for the kills. It's going to take quite a bit of work for him to get around this. Got a lot of avenues to hit for six, a lot of protection. GG. Thank you for marking it a W for bust. <laughs> Appreciate it. Right, all right. Hope you all are having a good day out there. I got a surprise day off work, so that's always cool. I didn't... <laughs> it always gets me. I, I never, I never like, think of President's Day. I've never been like, wow, I need the day off of work to pay respects to the president. It's, uh, <laughs> it always strikes me as weird. At least I, I, I checked my phone before uh, making any adventures and realized <laughs> I didn't have to, I didn't have to work today. It's pretty sweet. So a little, little bonus for you all, a little bonus for me. I dig it. So what do we got here? We got some kind of Lucian Callista number. Let's see what we can do. And so I'm not too familiar with this deck. I, I know that it exists. I don't feel like I've ever played against it. It's a, a Soul Cleave style deck, but I don't think we want to be starting off with any of these units. We're not actually going to block Lucian here. Um, and uh, I, I think we're just going to eventually build towards the Divine Clerk. But the, the Clerk does suck a little bit uh, in that we don't have a way to uh, to, to give him lifesteal with the Dark and Aegeus. So hopefully by the time it's relevant, uh, we'll, we'll have the means to give him a little boost. All right, so he's going to be able to boom in on us. I, I was looking to get this Dark and Aegeus onto the Wounded White Flame to uh, activate our entire board. Oh, and he just doesn't attack? Ooh, fam. That's good, right? I think that's good. So we still just want to play it a little bit slow, I think. Uh, we can add in another dragon and then just pass. Or what if we just pass? Let's see what he does. Wraith Caller. Okay, I feel a little bit safer now. Uh, I, I, we're going to want to be playing this Concerted Strike onto something. Probably the Callista, but maybe Lucian is scary enough if he's going to threaten to flip. And uh, I want to kind of keep this back. Now, the thing with Concerted Strike, if you're not familiar with the Faded units and the Dragons and stuff, uh, it's going to count as a target for both. So they each get a, uh, a strike out of this, or a target for Faded, and then they also get a follow-up uh, potential kill with the Fury. So we'll see how this goes. I might have just taken this too slow. We might have needed a Concerted Strike right there to get the Fadeds. I don't think we can put the Concerted Strike on the stack and then move forward to block. So we're probably just going to get get domed for all the Fearsomes. But find, find out in short order. Let's see. You have you have the, the power now, right? No, he does not. Okay. But it's only a five damage hit this round, so it's not terrible. So this should hit Callista for five damage. So we'll flip his Lucian. That's a problem for another day. <laughs> I, I, oh, it didn't. Oh, shit. Where did all his, all his units didn't die? I just saw all those units coming forward in combat and like, these guys are dead. <laughs> these are done for. Not the case. Not the case. All right. Oof. Only had two units die there. All right. We're starting to build up, though, now. Like, I, I'm curious... 
the amount of interactivity this deck is realistically able to play. Uh, as we were playing, uh, say, like Callista Nocturne, we did not uh, have any interactivity in the deck outside of that thing that draws Nocturne, potentially gives you like a five mana attacker. Th these decks tend to not play a lot. So I I'm curious if he has a way to do something here. Does not. Excellent. Get a nice reset on Dilution. All of the dragons are glow growing. Callista, or what's your name? Shivana's growing. Looks good. Alright, I feel pretty good about that. If he's just trying to go big with the with the wraiths. Seems like we're in a, a pretty safe space. We've got two units that we can block. Probably gonna have to start throwing away some of our dragons, but seems reasonable. It's it's extremely nice that our, our wounded white flame isn't going to die here. Alright, so we're taking five. Still have a Shivana in hand. I think it's okay. Get the Shivana on board. See if we can't pick up something cool along the way. Get to it. Something cool? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not really. We just bring everybody, right? He's gonna put his unit in front of the wounded white flame. Maybe that's maybe it's reason enough to keep the white flame back. Uh just so we can uh Make sure we have a blocker for next turn, because we're never going to lethal this turn, right? We're going to just try and go for these two single combats off the Shivana, see if she can't, uh, you know, weaken down the board. But, hmm. How big are these six twos? And I'm curious if he ever has another one. Let's go for tough here. Like, if he gets another Mist Wraith, that gives him a lot of protection in terms of uh, these single combats that are about to come down. At how capable you are you can you can single combat down a mist wraith all on your own wraith collar number two nasty that's a that's a natural version as well all right so i mean it seems like <laughs> it seems like oh oh snap shit just got real Oh man, I didn't know I didn't know it was capable of getting so real. I was hoping he attacked with both and then we got to block the Wraith collar with Shivana, then single combat down the Mist Wraith. Like that was gonna be huge. <laughs> that was gonna be huge. Not what we were able to do, but I was hoping. I had I had dreams. Now this is where it gets kind of interesting, right? We we did put the uh, uh, the ability onto uh, Jaral, right? We put the Jaral onto the Shivana. 
now this is the next opportunity where you know it would have been kind of nice to be able to attack with it <laughs> maybe we could have finished off the game in that sense but uh, I, I think our shivana would have died along the way she really needed the tough All right, Risen Mist and Nocturne. We're big enough to block all this, just barely. Just barely. Oh, but if he if he kills off our Shivana, we get the Gerald back and just win the game. Enjoy. Maybe that's coming upon him right now. He says, oh no. Oh no, it's Gerald City. I don't have the appropriate emotes. This is a disaster. <laughs> disaster. Wrong emotes. There it is. That was a that was an awfully slow animation. I was afraid we messed something up there. <laughs> All right. Send them in. We got a uh, expanse's protection to hopefully stop any potential removal spells. We got him. GG. So that was not a very impressive round for the old uh, for the old divine clerks. I, I I might have to kind of rethink those if that's going to be a commonality or if that was just a oddity in that uh, we didn't get the bonus. Now I I guess I'm not playing any cards that provide gems. Maybe they're just not going to be that great in this deck. Uh, or at least to the space I wanted. And I, I have it in my head that we're playing the uh, all of the units that generate gems. And without those units generating gems, it is a little bit more challenging to get him up to uh, up to three attack. Now, in this space against Jace Lux, I think this hand's kind of fine, right? I think with this meta that we're in right now, we're going to have to kind of stop and think if we want to... Uh, actually hang on to some of these Steadfast Elkin kind of cards, because there's a lot of matchups to where they're just not going to be relevant, and we're going to want to find just a big build-around kind of card. But I, I, I think with this start, with the Broadwing and the Lodestone, it's going to be okay. Show them the magic. Look at that. All them toughs. Mm. Feels nice. Toughest Elkins 2023. Right? Vayne got nerfed before 2023, right? The the Aatrox Vayne deck was not a not a thing in the year of 2023. It's been a, a bit of a thing, I'm sure, but getting it out of here. That does remind me. I uh I was following along with the 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 event schedule and this week in the 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 battlegrounds whatever they're called the daily the daily rumble it was supposed to be the unlimited deck building thing to where you could just play all the factions you could play all the champions you could play minimum of 30 cards maximum of 75 but if you click on the gauntlet thing it's apparently just a um just a, a kind of regular or no it's a champions unlimited and not that specific event and so i think that was kind of a bummer so here i'm not going to count on fiora getting any kind of kill but i think we can just chunk in for a shitload of damage So the idea I was looking for here is we barrier the Broadwing, Fiora's alive at one health, we attack with everybody, we hit for 11 damage, uh, we just hook this dumb dumb out of combat with the Broadwing, and then we're just really close to the lethal. Um, he had a, a different set of ideas, but I think that was, that was a pretty valid uh, uh, attack concept. 
Now here I'm gonna keep boosting the Elkin. I, I don't think uh, we're, we're ever gonna get this Broadwing into a space to where it's gonna get a relevant hook in. So we'll, we'll keep you out of the mix for the moment. Interesting. Well, let's add in the dragon. It can survive most of his major spells. It won't survive a thermogenic beam, but it can survive the rest of the stuff. And then we can kind of decide for next turn if we want to just uh, go for both units or, or how we're going to approach this. I assume he's going to come in and hook the Broadwing. Interesting. He takes down the Elkin, and that's the one with the equipment on it. Bust finds that interesting. They wouldn't take down the Broadwings. He's just not scared of the lethal. Like, let's see. He needs, like, an assembly line to get two dudes on the board. That one's a little better. We still have a lot of potential to just end the next turn, though. Oh. Bring in the flurry. I feel you, dog. Dropping spells like your Ezreal or something out here. Strength and grace, beauty in the blade. So let's see how this goes. We we might have played this in the wrong order. I, I had in my head that we were just going to uh, Wandering Shepherd, the Fiora, but this might have been a better space to put in a Broadwing and then try and go for the Darkened Lodestone as well. Quick attack. All right. Not as ideal. We we are in a space to where we can just start dropping Harazi though, so it is kind of nice having the the big equipment in hand. But it it feels like we could have just potentially won the game on that previous turn. We'll just let that go and count on our count on our combat units here. Pretty nice collection of bros coming through. Deliver in the GG. All right. On to the next one. Hey, that trying to climb us right out of the diamonds. Find us in that master's zone. Gotta unlock all the prismatics so we can feel like we paid to win with this account. <laughs> I, I I felt bad. I, I I pulled up this deck, and uh, I I accidentally clicked on the uh, I accidentally clicked on the uh, the the skin screen, and I saw that the like it's pool party Shivana, which is one of my favorite, or pool party Fiora, one of my favorites. I love all the pool party skins; they're all just so happy and everything. And then Shivana has like four different skins to pick from because everybody likes dragons. And uh, <laughs> don't get to use any of that on this account. We just got this green ass board just down here with the peasants playing with the the basic loadout. <laughs> I didn't I didn't know life was gonna be so hard, man. It is. It is. All right, friend, get equipped. This has been a, a fairly awkward start. This is kind of my, my worry I was talking about and why we're including the, the Divine Clerks into the deck. Now, I guess if it came down to it, we could just load up the, um, the those like sacrificial dragon things. You can't just put equipment on it and attack with them and stuff, but... I don't know, man. That, that seems just kind of weak to me. We gotta pass. I was hoping we could fish fight the Annie, but if he just if he if he brings the All Star play of Mystic Shot into our unit, then we're we're kind of hosed. But this is bad. This is not a. Uh, 
whenever you're playing against the deck like Annie Ezreal and they're able to, to build up more board than you, uh, something has gone wrong. <laughs> something has most definitely gone wrong. I feel like this is probably a pretty weak matchup anyways. Like, I'm not really excited about running um, a bunch of tall units into a disintegrate heavy deck, but this this deck was not or this hand was not ready for it one of the things i will call out though is uh the the way we handle a lot of these combats or a lot of these interactions the wandering shepherd in the pantheon version was you like really needed to be having the targets so that it could um you had to have the unit on the board to get the target as you play the wandering shepherd and improvise it that doesn't count as a target for. Uh, it doesn't count as a target for Pantheon, but in this deck you don't really care. It's just a lot more frequently just a pretty high-valued unit. We get all these slow fish fights in here. This is this is not good. I'm just gonna stop here. Like I'm gonna try and fish fight down the Annie. She's getting really close to flipping, and uh, that that feels kind of like the dream to me. <laughs> if we're able to stop the Annie flip and have her reset and have to do a lot more work to to become relevant, don't even gotta return the equipment on this one. All right, Steadfast Elkin. We can make these units a little bit more relevant if we're going to start dropping tough on them. Uh, it doesn't get them out of the disintegrate space, but it, it does weaken uh, a lot of the potential removals that are coming at them. I don't think it's worth going super all in here with. you can. We're not in the space to where we can stop Ravenous Flux, but... Hopefully take a little bit more work for you. We are all seeking an end to There's the big boy. Interesting, interesting. Fine. I mean, I we have to just start doing something. If he has a disintegrate, the game's just kind of done. Uh, but we, we, we're in that, that wonderful and glorious space to where you just have to have something go right. And... I, I think we have to just throw out the blocks and kind of hope for the best. Interesting. Look at that. Screeching Dragon's no longer damaged. <laughs> uh, the, the side benefit to uh, to what's been going on here. But we can build up some reasonable board and we can get... I'm trying to think of how we want these to go as to whether or not we're, we're going to go deep on these equipment. I'm kind of thinking of this as like, well, the the, the deck tries to get these big shutdowns in, in the middle of combat. And so if we're able to uh, place a Harazi next turn into the Dark and Aegeus or Jeral, have a, a pretty good angle of attack on on a lot of this. There's a disintegrate. All right. Well, we've at least got bored. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't think we win this game very frequently. I think this is a very uh, a very low win rate game. But you know, we we've got a a course of attack here. 
So maybe that'll be enough. This has been such a, a, a wonderful design with the Darken in the sense that they are, are so good early and so good late. I, I love cards that are like this. Never, never, you know, have to be at turn 10 of the game and draw Darken equipment and be like, fuck, I don't want to give a unit plus one plus one. You get, <laughs> you get to that turn 10 of the game and you draw Hirazi and you're like, hmm, mm, that's a delightful little nugget. That's a sweet thing to be adding to the board. I hope all of your nuggets are delightful, fam. <laughs> you heard it here first. That's my, my biggest hope in life. Save your worlds. We speak with blades. You dropped something. I dropped everything. Interesting seeing the aloof come in when we have all of these two health units. A little scary. A little scary, you know? Let's see. You can put the one healther in front of Geral so it won't take any damages. And then we can put the other one in front of Fiora. It's okay. Sure. Alright, so I... I, I ultimately have to worry that the next turn is just going to involve Ezreal, but, you know, if he doesn't have the Ezreal for the kill next turn, we have the second Jeral, or the second Harazi. We're in a, we're in a real space to take this one down out of nowhere. Take down that, take down that game we did not deserve. There he is. We shouldn't have played Harazi. We, we, we should have done the Guiding Touch first to see if we pick up a... Uh, a good spell, right? If we pick up a concerted strike off of that draw, it's gonna feel uh, it's gonna feel pretty bad. Here comes the chain. Here comes the spells. <laughs> Is that enough? It's, that's got to be enough, right? Yeah. G G. But not bad. Like uh, we we were, you know, right on the cusp of victory, with an absolutely abysmal draw. Right. I I feel like this matchup should be pretty terrible, but. If they're going to give us the time to get those Harazis on board, that's certainly a thing. And then we, we didn't have it happen there. I, I don't know if that deck plays Scorched Earth or not, but you can also find yourself in that space to where they're counting on like a, a broad main strike into a unit, and then you're able to uh, heal out of the Scorched Earth damage. It's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting aspect. All right, on to the next battle, though. Duvin Battle against Nora Twisted Fate. This is the Curious Shell Folk deck, and I love to say it every time this card comes up. I hate it so much. Uh, I, I, I hope that as a rotation happens, it just gets removed from the format. Uh, the, 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 the card that I always mention with this, you're probably tired of hearing it, but Jay Madarda, right? Jay Madarda sees absolutely no play. But when Jay Madarda does see play, it's going to be one of the most oppressive cards ever put into the game. You're just going to have some kind of degenerate combo that draws your entire deck then immediately wins the game. That's what Jay Madarda does. Uh, and I feel like Curious Shell Folk is right in the same space. Is that uh, the, these decks are kind of, you know, on the fringe right now. They may not uh, actually be the best thing you can be doing in this space, but I don't think anyone ever wants to be involved with a meta to where Curious Shell Folk is a legal card. <laughs> and so she's fine for the Path to Champions, do whatever you want out there. Uh, maybe it's okay uh, for the likes of uh, Path or for the likes of an Eternal format, but in terms of uh, 
uh, a constructive format. I don't I don't want her running around. So here, this was kind of interesting. I had to take some pause. We can say just wandering Shepard onto the Petrocyte Broadwing uh, and look to load her up with an equipment. But at the end of the day, taking down this Nora isn't the end of the world. Like if, if this Nora is still here, like when this turn is done, I'm kind of fine with that. But the thing I would like to do is build up this dragon just a little bit. And so uh, I'm kind of envisioning that... Uh, we, we just go ahead and get the dragon on board. We have a challenging attack for Nora. It's fairly tough for them to stop it. Most of their spells just deal one point of damage. Their ways to deal two points of damage here are things like throw the bomb, whatever the Zig's two damage slow spell is. And so I, I, I think it's pretty challenging for him to have a way to stop this attack from being successful. And if he does, you know, fine, that's not the end of the world. I do want to be saving this fish fight for the likes of Curious Shellfolk. Nora is annoying, but she's not the 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 be all end all problem here, right? We can we can deal with the opponent putting portals onto the board. That's just kind of the stall tactic. They're really looking to get the Shellfolk on the board, play a shitload of spells, and then uh, kill you with the the Burble Fish and kill you with the um, uh, Fleet Admiral Shelley. So ultimately not entirely worried about um, not entirely worried about the uh, Nora all right well you fought hard Broadwing it's pretty strong pretty strong uh, <laughs> thing, but again, I, I'm not really worried or too interested in killing these units. These Twisted Fate, the, these aren't the things that we really care about. We care about uh, Shelly, care about Burble Fish to a lesser degree, care about the, the Shell Folk, and so the Expanse's protection can be used to, to protect in that event. Might even need to use it preemptively to dodge something like Mini Morph. But let's get these dragons moving. Uh, it would feel pretty nice to uh, to be generating some single combats when we make these attacks. So let's get Shivana in. Just be ready to swing. I think it's cool. Do you think Dr. Ralph Pinne is a master of pasta? Is that what he does for a living? <laughs> He's probably never heard this joke, right? probably never heard it if you got a you got a name like penne you've probably never heard a uh never heard a pasta joke you heard it here first master of originality boomer at his best ftp bust coming at you dropping the pasta jokes on the opponents got him real good <laughs> got him real good All right, though. Let's see how this turn goes. He lands the portal. We could potentially take down Shelly, right? We picked up the fish fight, but the concerted strike is the draw that we're actually looking for here. That feels pretty fantastic. Can we strike with both? No, we can't. The, the the dragon should be enough to get the the damage we need here, anyways. But let's take the show folk down first. I, I don't want him doing all the bullshit and generating all of the spells. Then we'll look to take down Shelly second. If we didn't draw the concerted strike, I would have looked to have just killed Shelly. Uh, Shelly is the big game-ending kind of card. It's like the show folk is the engine, but the Shelly is what uh, does the finishing blow. And we could last a turn or two with the show folk on the board, but uh, if Shelly's on the board, that's where the, the real damage is going to come through. Time 
Do we want to uh, just do the actual strike? That seems a little dangerous. I definitely want to do it this turn. I don't want him the chance to untap and get many morphs in his hand, but um, I, I think there is some merit to not returning the equipment. It, it should be tough for him to get a get a strike kill. Like he, I get the the thing that worries me is like, okay, you play trinket trade, and then trinket trade gives you a one mana combat trick, and then that grows your Shelly because you played a bunch of spells, and then now the combat trick's enough to kill the white flame. Like I I. I Without sitting here and like going through every spell that's available to them, I can't really do it. But uh, I, I think it's just a lot safer uh, taking this slower approach. Do want to get some of this stuff on board though. the The worry we have here is a stun. Maybe we just swing. I want to make sure that we get the single combat on the turn, right? We're never going to lethal him. We're presenting lethal here as it is. Well, we do have the Expanse's protection. Let's bring it in. If he wants to bring the, the stun onto Shivana, we have the, the spell shield. But I want to stop here. I want to make sure we have the four mana for the turn. Uh, just to, to get the the expanses protection plus the single combat coming out of Shivana. Pasta Bros taking all the fucking time in the world, really cutting into our, <laughs> really cutting into our number of games here, bro. Oof. Think think on this forever. All right, there we go. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. I'm ready for combat. How you feeling, buddy? This will not stand. Fears some coming through. This is a, a, a kind of interesting spot with the equipment in that it would be really nice to put the fearsome equipment onto Harazi. And then use Harazi to really just hit. Oh, we hit. I thought he really just hit all three portals, but he hit two with a uh, with a domination. But no, I uh, kind of want to get the uh, ability onto Harazi. Can we lethal here? I think we're short. We can come in for two more damage though. He's only got two mana, so he's not going to play any any of his important units. But getting this uh, six tick twisted fate off the board is kind of nice. Poke it. So do we want to get the Elkin on the board? We've been a little bit sloppy with him. We may have wanted to get him down a little bit earlier. I think he's okay. I I think on this next turn we're just like we're playing Harazi. And then we're gonna have two mana backed up with that two spell mana. We can then look to use the expanse's protection. Or now that we picked up single combat, that might change. Depends on what unit he plays. But I mean, even if he plays like either Shelly or the Shell Folk. We can just single combat off of the Harazi and then have the spell shield. And so I feel pretty safe. Again, like the, the biggest disaster for us is going to be we go for a, a single combat onto one of his key units and then he has like a mini morph. And so the single combat doesn't kill his shell folk and then we have a problem. How we feel about these pranks though? Just pass. He's got to do something relevant. If he comes in and just pranks the lodestone a bunch of times, we can just load it up as an equipment. He's at three, so getting three out of the shepherd and, and the elkin is, is quite strong. He's too far away from comboing now, though. All right. Burblum, dude.
more pokey sticks coming in. Do we want to just go ahead and do this now? I'm actually a little bit more interested in not the burble fish, but the 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 unit that can block a fearsome. If we want to just try and keep our our, our dude out of combat. I think I like this. I want to play this before he gets to prank. He can't kill us at this point, right? He can play Shelly, but if he plays Shelly, he doesn't have any mana. It's going to have to be some kind of like really weird multi burble fish draw with combat tricks or some shit that, uh, that OTKs us from here. Joy is a good look in a book. What up, Nora? Are you gonna spike a portal and make a fearsome blocker? Got potential. Got potential. Yeah, if we don't if we don't kill on this upcoming turn though, we're not gonna Maybe we can still win the game. Don't waste my time. Maybe we can do it. Did he fill out his board? No. It's just like after he's played all these trinket trades, I guess he has been generating otter pusses, but it's like after he's played all these trinket trades, I just start to worry that uh got a combat trick in hand. But I I think he's he, he's taking the otter puss every time. Not sure why you'd want to prank here. I guess the first one's okay, just to get a peek at what you're, what you're about to run up against. But you probably don't want to play anymore. All right, how does it go? He does not hit. All right, well here comes the squad, ready to end it. Did you get a plus attack combat trick, my friend? Uh-oh, bringing out the blocks. It's not good seeing him come in front of the tutu, right? <laughs> That's probably not good. Maybe we'll Guiding Touch into a Pale Cascade, you know? That'll show him. Hey, Dr. Penny, you're really you're really hurting our followers here today. You've taken the, the vast majority of the game. I'm sure you have a lot to think about. This is a very critical match as we're doing battle in Diamond 3. <laughs> the utmost criticality coming at us. What's this? None of our units die. We'll cycle the guiding touch. I don't we can still hit a dragon overwhelm. Didn't find it. That's okay. It's only got two cards in hand, so I'm not I'm not super worried about what's happening here. Probably should have strafing struck in the middle of combat though, right? These pranks have the potential to be annoying. If he just chains all of them off. Like, I don't know how he actually wins the game if he just chains off all of his pranks, but... Probably should have done it in combat. Hi, dude. Let's take some more time. <laughs> <laughs> take take a little bit more time here. I, I as people that enjoy these decks, like I know this isn't the the style of deck that I enjoy, but like I I, I just have to ask the question: at, at what point does the amount of fun you're having like really trail off? You know, like is is this a moment? Is this like peak fun that that opponents having right now? Is like oh life. Life doesn't get better than this. I'm having a I'm having a jolly old time right now. <laughs> I don't know. It just it, 
it, it strikes me as like I I feel like I have a, a limited amount of time to do things within my 16 hours of the day and uh whatever he's doing I mean props to the doc he's having fun I guess but it seems fucking abysmal to me Props to the doc. Papa doc out here bringing some mom spaghetti, you know? <laughs> well, that'll show us real good. I feel like that's probably the game breaker right there. Dropping the poison dart onto the steadfast Elkin. Oh, and a group shot. Okay. I feel you. Game clearly over now all right let's see here let's attack with some units i guess we want to hit the two attacker down here with our Jeral. make it a little bit more challenging to hit a fearsome blocker let's see what we can do from there but this one card was a real doozy Probably need to think on it for at least the next 45 seconds as to what we can do with this one draw that we just hit. We know that our opponent has an Expanse's Protection in hand. Lots of viable options to get Dr. Pasta out of this game. I just play with my beard a little bit, you know? You need something to do? <laughs> I wonder if he just rage quit. Did we ruin the doc's day that hard? When we were playing Expedition, the thing that would happen is people would, you know, see that they're playing against the one and only FTP busts, and then they'd stop to call their mom down there. they say, yo, Ma. Ma, get down here. Check it out. Come down to the basement. We're battling FTP bus today. I bet I'm on the internet later. They were right. They were. But then when they lost, they felt real bad, you know? They called their ma down to the basement and everything, and the games were done. They didn't achieve victory. Their friends didn't get to bask in the glory, and so it was a bit of a painful day. But looking at the time, we're over an hour. That's where we're going to call it. We blame the lack of games on Dr. Pasta there, and we'll just move on to the recap. And so, you know, interesting deck, interesting set of games. I, I again, like, have to ask a couple of questions in that how much better was Fiora than a Pantheon was? Like, did we play any of those games to where, you know, Fiora threatened a lot to where Pantheon didn't do it? And she she did come down early and have quite a bit of relevance. We didn't come anywhere near close to getting Fiora OTKs, but that's not always the the thing that you have to take note of, right? It's kind of the uh, the the intangibles, as they would call it in, in the land of football. You know, what makes Patrick Mahomes such a great quarterback? It's not his canon. It's not his knowledge of the game. It's not the 60 to 80 hours a week he's devoted to his football knowledge and his body for the past 15 to 20 years. Uh, it's the intangibles, right? It's that that thing that you just can't put your finger on that makes him so good it's not the hard work it's probably he said a prayer to god that was probably a part of it and then after that it was all those intangibles and that's what you get a lot of out of fiora is the intangibles it's that you know your opponent has to always kind of keep in the back of their mind that they're uh they're they're just going to lose to fiora and so you have to kind of play like a little bit cautiously you have to leave some of your units in your hand so fiora doesn't threaten the otk you might have to kind of hold back combat trick for something that's happening in the future and your opponent with their their limited knowledge of what's in your hand uh, isn't able to make the same informed decisions we are as to where in some of those games we're like, yeah, fuck it, we're not going to OTK this game. Let's get really aggressive with this Fiora. And so we know that, but our opponent doesn't know it. And uh, that's a lot of what you pick up with Fiora that you don't see with Pantheon and that you're able to uh, affect the game a lot earlier and have a bigger impact. And so a lot of those games, you know, did really drag on. We, we played against a lot of like Burblefish and, and some of the slower decks in the format. And uh, I'm not entirely certain how i feel about you know pantheon there or if you know we would have rather have just had fiora as we're attacking across like three and four different turns fiora would have definitely been strong in that final game uh but we just didn't draw her and so it's kind of tough i'm kind of leaning towards the the fiora aspect um 
because we weren't really pulling off OTKs with Pantheon too often. It was a lot of times the the game was late. We just had a bunch of giant dudes. Anyways, it feels like Pantheon was just better against like the aggro matches where we were uh, hoping to spike lifesteal or in these spots to where we needed to really like swing for the fences and hit um, a, a big collection of abilities. And he was, uh, you know, I, I guess the way to kind of describe it is if they're, uh, you know, operating at a, a 50% card quality all of the time, it, it's because Fiora hovers around, you know, 45% to 55% usefulness to where Pantheon is like, 25% some games, but 75% other games, right? there, their Pantheon feels much more polarized in his quality as to where Fiora is, you know, just slightly above average all the time. Pantheon might be bad sometimes, but he's fucking amazing uh, in some different ones. And so I, I think that's kind of interesting. I, I could definitely see an argument for either one. Uh, but in terms of these others cards, I was definitely happy to have access to the Dragon's Clutch. I, I really like being able to... Uh, spread out the overwhelm or draw two dragons should we need to. Uh, and then the only thing I was kind of disappointed in with this was the Divine Clerk. I, I feel like the idea and concept of the Divine Clerk is good, right? We have a lot of these games to where we aren't doing anything until like turn three or turn four, and, and we just want like something to put on the board, something to really have our, our board kind of pop off a little bit, and we just don't get that out of the Clerk. And so, uh, again, when we were playing with Pantheon, uh, we had access to the gems. Being able to toss a gem onto him made him much more relevant. Uh, and with this deck list here, we just don't have access to that. And so uh, I, I could definitely see cutting both of those. Maybe it's the kind of space to where uh, we, we cut cut them and add in like one gem maker, just so we have like a seventh early game unit. And then we swing back into having a uh, uh, the, the third Dark and Aegeus, just to make sure that we have that. Uh, attachable equipment in the early game. I'm not quite certain on the the selling point there, but uh, I feel like this is pretty close to to where you want to be. And so, good stuff. Not a bad set of games. I had fun with that. I hope you did too. And so that is going to do it for us today. I hope everyone enjoyed the video. Hope you maybe learned a thing or two along the way and had a good time watching. So this is Bust and we thank you for being here. <laughs>